13th of 1972, flight number 571 went down in the Andes. Here to talk about that and so much more about it. I'm really excited about this episode. I have the author of this incredible book with me today. His name is John Guyver. Thank you so much for joining me, John. I am excited to have this conversation with you. Amanda, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be on your podcast and hopefully we can have a very interesting discussion about this, you know, very iconic story. It really is. And we were talking a little bit before we uh, jumped into the recording about how this isn't covered in things like air crash investigations, but there's so much to this story. I mean, your book, how many pages is this book? Well, it's 571 pages. <laughs> but there are a lot of really cool photos and stuff in the book yeah. that I think a lot of people would probably really enjoy seeing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's about 200,000 words, but there are, so there are a lot yeah. of photos in it. Yeah. Yeah. And you cover things like the survivors, about the people who didn't survive, about their yeah. families, about the pilots, about what happened, and about the aftermath after the crash. Because a lot of people don't realize that there was a period of over 70 days where these people had to survive on their own in the Andes. And what they had to do was just, oh, heartbreaking. Your book is just incredible. So let's talk a little bit about what made you want to write this book. What intrigued you about the story? Well, I mean, perhaps I should just give a, a very brief summary of the story to to sort of, you know, in case some of your listeners, uh, uh, you know, are not too familiar with it. Um, so, so it's um, a plane crash that happened in the Andes in 1972. It was a rugby team, very close knit one. They all knew each other. They'd all gone to the same school, um, and the plane lost um, lost its way in the Andes, um, hit a ridge. Um, and the wings came off, the tail came off, it um, tobogganed down the other side of the ridge and ended up in uh, this remote valley high up in the Andes. And as you said, uh, no one heard from them again for another 70, 70 days, 72 days. Um, and the story is incredible in so many ways, which we'll, which we'll, which we'll get into. So to, to answer your, your question, um, I had always been interested in the story since there was a book called Alive by uh, an English author, Piers Paul Reed, that was the authorized account, the official account. And it was written in 1974, a fantastic book. Um, and it really, you got to know, you know, the situation, you got to know the survivors and, uh, and so on. Um, I was fascinated. Uh, I was a little bit, um, one of the things that bugged me about the book was that um, the people who didn't survive, who were very important to the whole survival process, because many of them survived for, you know, quite some time on the mountain, but also because of what they had to do, uh, we didn't really know about them. So I wanted to find out about these, 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 these non-survivors. And um, in 2013, I, I made a trip to the to the mountain where where this this crash occurred, where they stayed for seventy two days. I was with a a small expedition of um, I think we were about fifteen people, and um, uh, you know it was an incredible experience. But I got to know one of the survivors, a guy called Eduardo Strauch, and through him I got to know another survivor, a guy called Pedro Gorta, um, and. Uh, Pedro, I, I'd always wanted to meet actually because he he was um, he was perhaps the most aloof of all the survivors, and so from an outsider's point of view, perhaps you know someone you could identify with with more. Uh, and um, what I did was I I offered to translate his memoir, which had just come out, despite not speaking a word of Spanish. <laughs> um, but I I actually carried through with that and. Um, uh, I translated his memoir, we became good friends, and through him I gradually became embedded in the community. So I started to meet a lot of people, the other survivors, uh, you know, I'm good friends with many, many of them. Um, but um, for me, it was more important, the families of those who didn't come back, and these were the brothers and sisters. And so I, I started to get more and more involved. I also, sort of, that's sort of one side of it. The other side was um, I contacted Piers Paul Reed, who wrote the original Alive, 
And he was very kind. He opened up his, his archive and gave me privileged access to his archive, which includes interviews with, uh, you know, with, um, with the survivors from, from the time, from 1973, a couple of months after they'd returned. Um, and so I, I gradually sort of built up this, this huge body of knowledge and also had, you know, very immediate contact with um, many of the protagonists in the story. And I felt it was important to write, um, you know, a comprehensive history of the, the event um, from a perspective really of 50 years. So. Yeah. I, it's hard to wrap my brain around the fact that that was 50 years ago. Um, I'm older than I look. <laughs> Gosh, and look yet, it, yet it really was that long ago. And they still have families that are still alive and in some cases, absolutely thriving in yeah. spite of having gone through such a horrific tragedy of losing family members or having a family member go through everything that they had to go through. Right. You know? Let's talk a little bit about what, what these guys had to go through after the accident. So the plane went down, right. they tobogganed over the bridge. They're in this remote Valley. Nobody's going to find them. And they think that this is going to be the end for them. Well, no, they're, actually they're, they're, um, in the in the immediate aftermath of the accident, there's still 33 out of the 45 people on the plane. There were 40 passengers and five crew members. Um, there's still 33 that are alive. Uh, a few of them die, so they they have to shelter in this broken fuselage. So it's it's, it's sort of open at the back where the tails come off, and it's sort of broken in various places. Um, they they try and get the seats out and make some a bit of room, and there several you know, who are, are fairly badly injured and they all try to cram in because it's, it's desperately cold. It's, there's a snowstorm, there's an icy wind. Um, and people are in pain, people are crying out. Um, so surviving, I mean, that first night was absolute hell. And um, five or six of those um, survivors die on that, on that first night. And so they're really... You can say there are 28 people who who genuinely survived the accident and they they have to start you know, they they believe they're going to be rescued you know very soon i mean you would right you're right in a you plane crash it's gone down you, you survived um you know the pilots were in contact with the with the control tower and um they assume they're going to be um you know rescued they you know they they soon find out that water is a big issue because um you know, there's only snow and ice and you can't really hydrate with that. So they figured out ways to melt the water. Um, of course, there, there were a couple of medical students, you know, first, second year medics right. who, you know, who, who sort of uh, took care of the injured and there were a few broken legs. There were some, you know, bad cuts and hemorrhaging and stuff like that. But they did a pretty amazing job. Yeah, they really and stepped then, up. I yeah, love that part of their story. They just, you know, they it's went terrible. to action. They knew that this was what they needed. So we're going to yeah. do this. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the captain of the team, he was um, a guy called Marcelo Perez. He was, um, uh, you know, organizing the everyone who's getting people where you, you know, that you group of people, you need to get the seats out of the fuselage. You guys need to make water. You need to sort of, you know, take the dead bodies out and the, the doctors and then the, uh, and so on. So it was all, and the fact that they were all very closely knew each other, you know, I think, I think it helped there, but there were definitely some leaders who stepped up yeah. um, immediately and very, you know, very proactively. And then on, on the, on the, the Sunday, so they crashed on a Friday sort of late afternoon on the Sunday, they saw planes go over search planes. And they go, oh, great. You know, they've seen us, uh, that we're going to be rescued in a day or two. It'd be fantastic. And the days go by and, you know, and, and nothing, nothing happens. And, and the realists among them, you know, say, well, we're, you know, they, they've given up on us. The, the planes searched over our area. We've heard them searching further away. You know, they're definitely not coming. And so they had to make the very difficult decision. You know, what are we going to, how are we going to survive? Because yeah. they tried, they tried some expeditions. They couldn't get, you know, more than a few hundred feet from the fuselage. The snow was deep. It's too cold to stay out overnight. Um, so, so they had to make the decision to use the bodies of their 
you know, of their of their friends. And these really were their friends. I mean, these were people they'd gone to, you know, primary and middle school with. They were basically um, family. Yeah, yeah. And 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 really how they they sort of rationalized it in many ways, but the real thing that helped them break the taboo was they said, well, look, if, you know, if I die, I'm I'm gonna be, I'm happy to be for my body to be used. And right. by extrapolation, because we know these guys so well, you know, we think that they would say the same thing. And so that provided sort of a one of the big rationalizations. <clears throat> so um so that, you know, that they they sort of gradually start and then they heard on little radio um you know after they'd made this decision really that you know they got the official conf confirmation they heard a, a station in uruguay um which is where the the guys were from they were from uh, uruguay which is in the eastern part of um south america and they were flying to chile which is in the west uh part of south america and so they're flying over the andes um they heard that the search had been called off and they weren't going to resume it for, a, you know, another till February and it was October. So, um, that had to so be terrifying. Said, well, but what, what it did was they, they went from this situation where they were waiting and it was sort of, they were waiting for someone to rescue them to, you know, one where, well, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Yeah. And so, because of course they decided on the food thing, they started, building up some of the the rugby players to you know help you know to get strong to they got extra food to to trek out of there and then the whole you know plan was thrown out of the window when um an avalanche hit right mm -hmm. uh, after um well it was about two weeks in as and if they didn't already have enough problems. If you, you can imagine <laughs> this, so so it killed eight more of them, you know, oh. their friends, and um, and the if you can imagine, they're already stuck in this remote valley, but now they're in a plain that's half full of snow, and the the surface of the plain is covered as well, so they're sort of buried in the snow in the plain underneath the snow in a remote valley. You can't really get any more isolated than that. Yeah, and even if they did pick up the rescue searches again, there's no way they would have seen this. Right, right. There's no way. And so um, so it took them three days to get out of that. And um, then the rest of their story is really about various expeditions they made and until they, uh, you know, many of them aborted, until the point they made the, the final expedition, two of them, well, three of them set out, one returned. Yeah. And two of them did a 10-day trek through the Andes and were spotted by... Um, a shepherd high up in the Chilean uh, foothills. Wow. Um, and that, that was the first anyone outside had heard from them, you know, for, for 70 days. Was there any animosity among the families when they, when they found out what had happened to their loved ones who had passed on? Well, ex extraordinarily, um, I mean, so, so of course there was a lot of, after two or three days, it emerged what they what they'd done, and there was a lot of sensationalist headlines in the in the right. press, particularly in Chile and Argentina and the rest of South America. Not so much in in Uruguay, um, uh, but they they decided really not to speak too much to the press until they got back to Uruguay when they held a, a press conference and they and they dealt with the issue there in a very you know very um, respectful way. Um, and the the, um, the 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 families of those who died were actually very supportive. And actually, I just want to read out some of the things that um, some of the families said. So one of the fathers of one of the boys who died, he said, thank God that 45 were there so that 16 homes were able to regain their children. I mean, incredible, wow. right? Uh, so another said, um, one of the mothers said, uh, we support the decision taken by the boys and we're trying to help them overcome this idea or ordeal. So the, their viewpoint was, you know, these 16 survivors, they're going to be under huge psychological, you know, pressure because of, you know, the world <laughs> looking in at what they've done. But we're, we're going to support them in this or ordeal because we can help them better than anyone because we're the, you know, the, the parents of their friends. So it's, um, there were some incredible reactions and there were others. And I mean, there were some families who who felt um, 
you know, who distanced themselves from it and felt that, that, it, that it shouldn't have happened. But they were the exception rather than the norm. And it's amazing that they were so willing to embrace them. Hey, you survived. That's, you know, yeah. congratulations. I'll miss my family member forever, but you survived. You got through this. Now, that and, and you can imagine. That's cool. You can imagine, Amanda, this, this, um, so to, to give you a sense of how, how close this community was. So this was a small community in Montevideo, you know, a, a privileged community. It was a professional community. Um, in 1960, so this was 12 years before the accident, 26 out of the 40 passengers were at the same middle or, or junior school. Wow. Um, so the, the rugby team um, that came out of them were old boys of that school, and they'd actually won the Uruguayan Championship. All, all rugby was amateur in, in those days, and in fact, till quite recently. Um, so they were a very good rugby team. They were the best, the best in Uruguay at the time. Um, but you imagine these come from this neighborhood of maybe, you know, a couple of thousand people or, you know, a few thousand people. Um, everyone knew each other, um, you know, survivors and people who died had, you know, girlfriends in the, you know, in the, in the community and they were cousins and, you know, neighbors and and so on. Everyone had a you know very strong connection to almost everyone on the flight. So now you get the situation where you get a survivor coming back, and they're living next door to someone you know friend of theirs who's who's not only you know died in the Andes, but they had to use his body to survive. So it's, you can imagine this um, immense. Um, I mean, pe people didn't really want to talk about it in the community for many many years because the survivors didn't want to you know bring up the People subject want to relive and, something like that yeah you know i yeah. mean it's hard enough to go through it but yeah after you go through it people want to know details and they want people are nosy they want all yeah. the gory dirty details they don't want to know the good stuff it's the bad right. news that travels the fastest well, I think I think that's true. Although, although within that community, everyone was <clears throat> everyone was very respectful. The people, the families, didn't want to know any details about what happened on the mountain. Yeah, they didn't. They they said, look, that this is something the survivors did. That's their business. It's it's none of our business. Um, you know, that's that's private to them. And I think you know, to a large extent, that's that's the way it should be. Yeah, I, I think that was a really uh, very mature way to handle it. Yeah. You know, I don't know if we would have that kind of maturity here in a, a large city in, in Colorado. You yeah. know, I think we would struggle if something like this were to happen, you would have half the people congratulating the survivors and the other half up in arms and wishing that they were, you know, among the, the deceased. Well, I think, you know, I think maybe the closest thing is, is perhaps one of these small communities that have had, uh, have had school shootings, you know, those yeah. where yeah. a lot of people who know each other have, you know, some, I mean, my book's called To Play the Game. So some have won and some have, some have lost, um, right. you know, in, 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 in that game. And it, it's just, um, you know, a matter of chance of where, you know, where a particular child was, um, you know, when the, when the shooter came. Yeah. So, so I think, I think that's a good, uh, sort of good analogy to understand, yeah. you know, the grief and the, you know, and the healing and uh, and so on within a within a small community. To the best of your knowledge, what was it that really helped them to kind of come out of that? We don't want to talk about this. To where they were willing to talk to you so that you could get more information to actually tell the story of the deceased and the survivors. Well, for the for the survivors, you see, I with the survivors, although I, I know the survivors, some of them very well. Um, I didn't want to interview them for this book because they've talked about it so much yeah. that they can't, you know, it's difficult for them to remember exactly, you know, what was said in, in you know, the umpteen interviews they've done and not lots. So I really, I really wanted to go back to the original, you know, interviews from, from 1973 um, and, you know, and, and look at their statements there. 
to 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 tell their story for the the families um they're really most of them had never spoken about it outside the community and i started getting uh through my contacts you know getting very you know friendly with a few of the those families and chatting with them and the fact that i knew so much about the story and that i i wasn't a journalist i wasn't you know mercenary in any i wasn't looking for a, a sensational story um right you were a started... developer in artificial intelligence before this right <laughs> i was yes <laughs> um they they um you know, I mean, we 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 got a good rapport, and they warmed to me, and I certainly warmed to them. The the wonderful, wonderful people, unanimously. I mean, I can't. Every family I met was fantastic, um, but word of mouth spread that I was doing, you know, this project to try and sort of raise the profile of those who died, because for the point of view is history, you know, if if I look back, you know, in some of these historical events like um, Shackleton's open boat, um, you know, voyage and stuff like that. You, you have these people who are involved and you know so little about them, but they were so important to that whole episode. And I really felt for the for the history, well, um, the brothers and sisters were still, you know, were at a good point to speak about it. You know, most of them are similar age to me. They're sort of, you know, many of them retired. Um, and so there was an opportunity to speak to them and sort of word of mouth spread um, that I was doing this project to elevate um, those who didn't survive. Uh, and I did um, uh, a chapter on each one and I sort of sent them off to individually to the, the different families so they could see that this was actually becoming a reality. And mm -hmm. in doing that, I actually got much more engagement and so then i had to rewrite um all all the chapters again um and and so i think i think they came out very well but of course you know you can't tell those stories in isolation so i wanted to create i wanted to really tell the um the story in a in a in a, in a quite um detailed context so i talk about you know the history of uruguay the history of you know the the sort of um you know the neighborhoods they came from um you know a bit about the politics of the time um and so on so i wanted to really include all of that to so people could really understand the context these you know this group of people came from this very special community that the, these people came from to to really sort of humanize it in some ways because you know, so I say in my preface, you, you mention the story and people say, oh, that's that's the one about the rugby players, or often people say the football players who, you know, who ate each other. And it's sort of a bit, you know, yeah, grimy and, and yeah. sort of... That's um, disrespectful. Disrespectful. And in fact, they came from this very vibrant um, community, They're very, you know, well-educated or, or bilingual. You know, most of them speak, speak uh, good English. Um, they and uh so you know it, it, they they went from this fantastic community they lived in to suddenly this remote horrific environment uh completely separated from the world so it's an extraordinary story it really is i love that you've been able to bring it to life you have done so much to bring honor and dignity to the names of every person involved, not just those who survived. And it's, yes, yes. your book is, it's really, it's its beautiful. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I am really happy that I have a copy of it because I have several friends that I've been telling, hey, you're getting a copy of this for Christmas. You know, I'm getting my copy, but you're <laughs> getting a copy for Christmas because you got to read this story. It's amazing. Yeah, good. Well, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a book that has lots in it. Um, not everyone will want to read the whole thing. Some of us want to dip into it. People right. who know the story well, I think, you know, they really engage with it. People who, you know, just want to get a flavor of it, maybe they'll read, you know, some some bits of it, dip into, uh, into some bits of it. Um, you know, for people who are interested in air crash investigation, I have several chapters on, um, you know, the cause of the crash. 
right. um, which I think is, is is quite interesting. It's very very technical, but um, it's sort of uh, sort of an air crash investigation. Yeah, absolutely. And you went from, like I said, an, a, a creator and developer for artificial intelligence to diving into that technical world and diving into the humanity of it. And I just think that is so fascinating. You found your passion and you followed well, it. Yeah, it, it was always a passion. It just came at the right time. You know, I, I just sort of, I probably would have retired a couple of two or three years after I actually did. Um, so it sort of precipitated um, my retirement because I just didn't have the time. I wanted it to be out for the, you know, for the anniversary of the, of the um of the event yeah um so it's sort of a, it, it it hastened my retirement but it came at the right time yeah i mean it was a great it was a great retirement project and this memorial image that's on the cover of your book yes when you went there did you take this i, I went there this was taken in december uh, i can't remember what year i think it's around 2010 or so or 12 I think more like 2012 or 13 yeah um um and it was taken by a, a mountaineer who's one of um a group of of um five people who followed at the same time of year the footsteps of the two who, who trekked out so you see at the very back of that picture you see that 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 sort of head wall right at the back right um in the middle that's actually um, three thousand feet high. That wall goodness there. gracious! Um, and that's the what they that, that's what they climbed. It took them three days to get to the top of that. So th these distances are really, really, um, you know, misleading. Um, and that and the, the 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 tomb you see there. Yeah, I have been there. I've been there twice. Um, so when I went there, there wasn't snow around the tomb, but there was on the glacier. I uh, went in in January two thousand thirteen and two thousand fifteen. Um, that that's where the you know, the the remains are, are buried um, up there, and there there's a big pilgrim. You know, there's a pilgrimage there every year in the in the summer that um, you know many Argentinians, Uruguayans, and people from all around the world um, uh, go up there to to pay their respects. Really, if you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself. <laughs>